Are you ready to overcome the complexities and burdens that come with your success? Join the team at Centura Wealth Advisory in the Live Life Liberated podcast. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Live Life Liberated with the team from Centura Wealth Advisory. Today, Derek Myron is in the house. He is running the show today and he's got a special guest on. That is Mark Gleberman. He is the CEO of MG Properties. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Derek, how are you today? Doing great, Eric. You're on a trip, right? I am. I am on a trip. We're, we're week five. Week five of uh, 55 weeks. 55, 55 weeks of travel. Oh, man, that's exciting. I'm, I'm, I, I, I said before the show started, I'm living vicariously through Derek's adventures because I'm you know stuck here. <laughs> like A lot of people are stuck. Uh, but you've got Mark on the show today. Mark, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, this is exciting. Derek, why did you bring Mark on the show today? So Mark's specialty in it with MG Properties is in multifamily real estate. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of interesting dynamics at play in, in real estate today. And I thought Mark would be a fantastic guest to share his perspective with our audience. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can't imagine what is going on. And so I'm really looking forward to the podcast because with everything, with the pandemic and I don't know about the rest of the country, but in the Midwest, housing prices are going crazy. Things are selling within 24 hours a lot of times. And so I don't know if this is a trend. And I know that you deal with multifamily stuff, Mark, but I'm, I'm curious to find out what's going on. So I'll, I'll just let you take over, Derek. Let's do this. All right. Thank you, Eric. Mark, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us this morning. My pleasure. Thank you again for having me. So why don't you tell us about... Uh, MG Properties and your background and what you guys do. Okay, certainly. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, first, starting with my background, I started my career as a tax specialist CPA with a couple of the large international accounting firms, worked with them for about five years and five years in private industry. During that time, I started dabbling with some smaller apartment properties, really more with a, a development focus and with smaller properties, left my more traditional jobs in 1989 with the intent of building a 19-unit apartment community, which eventually was built. But then in around 1991, we saw a major downturn in the economy and the real estate market, and I switched the focus from building apartments to putting together syndications, acquiring existing properties. And the first property we put together was in our first partnership was in 1992. And really since then, in almost 30 years, we've stuck with that same model of buying existing apartment properties, looking for opportunities to add value to those properties through renovations, through better management. The difference being in the early days, uh, we were buying 25 units and 38 units and 36 units. And Today, we're typically buying 200, 300, 400 unit properties, and we started in San Diego. First 10 years was all San Diego properties, expanded throughout Southern California around 2000, and since then have now expanded to Oregon, Washington, Arizona, Nevada, and throughout California, where we now have a portfolio of about 80 properties and about 22,000 apartment homes. Um, that portfolio is valued at roughly $5 billion. Wow. What, and what's the current headcount at MG today? So we are a vertically integrated firm. We have in-house property management, construction management, as well as our acquisitions team, accounting teams. So with all of the on-site team members, we have about 650 employees on the in the corporate office kind of our core team which is 95 percent in san diego is about 90 people okay and your tax background uh, led you to a structure whereby you buy one property at a time and in, in a gplp structure can you talk a little bit about that correct yeah and i do think that the the tax grant my tax background led to kind of the structure and strategy, which is an extremely tax efficient strategy. So our model is we will bring in investors on a deal by deal syndication basis. And when we sell a property, we will almost always do a 1031 tax free exchange, giving the limited partners the opportunity to 
move forward and defer their taxes or to cash out at that point and pay the appropriate you know, federal and state taxes. So this becomes a tremendous wealth building model as the majority of our partners will move forward in the exchange and essentially indefinitely not have to or defer those taxes. And I believe most of our, of our investors, including myself and our family, who have obviously are the biggest investors, look at it as a wealth building or estate building model, where if you have the properties pass through your estate, your heirs would receive a stepped up basis. So essentially you're avoiding paying that capital gains or income taxes indefinitely. And while you hold the property, the depreciation deductions that you get would generally offset your cash flow on the distribution. So along the way, you're seeing generally tax losses, never paying any taxes. And then ultimately, if you participate in those tax-free exchanges, you would never have to pay any income or capital gains taxes on the income. Extremely efficient from a tax perspective. Can you share to date, I know that over the last 28 years, you've purchased around 140 transactions. Is that about right? It's probably about 160. So we, we've, in our history, we've bought about 160 properties, and about half of those are 80 we have sold. On the sold properties, our average annual return net to the investors has been 26%. And that's similar to the current profits that are in the portfolio. What we are, though, seeing today is those returns are very difficult to duplicate as as all returns across all the investment, different investments are lower now, interest rates are lower. So today we're seeing returns that are probably, and these are projected, and we do, I believe, tend to be very conservative with our projections, but we're looking at somewhere in the 11 to 14% return, and that would include appreciation, and again, would be you know our conservative projections. The actual cash distributions that we're providing generally are starting around 5%, and over the life of the asset, typically around 7% is the average distribution. And in our typical hold is 7 to 10 years. If it makes sense based on market conditions to sell earlier, we certainly can and would do that. But the vast majority of the properties we hold between 7 and 10 years, and actually the roughly 80 properties that we have sold, the average hold period has been eight years. Okay. And I think even more impressive, yes, the average return has been 26%, but I believe your your worst return it was still a positive return, a six-year hold in a property in Seattle that made a, a 4% rate of return. And the best is a, was a one-year hold in Escondido that you made like 149% with the average being 26, that's a pretty darn impressive track record to have not lost money on a transaction. Yeah, and I think as a company, we, we probably take more pride in, in that, the fact that we've never lost any principal in those 160 investments. We've never lost any principal money for any investor, and we take great pride. In, and really, when we buy a property, we look more at the downside than the upside, assuring that we are protecting the principal that is invested. I know your clients appreciate that very, very much as well. Oftentimes, we call Mark, he's the uh, always wanting to trend to the upside. So under promise and over deliver, our clients tell us whatever Mark says, just double it. If uh, he tells you 11 or 12%, well, they assume 22 to 24% returns. That could be I'm a not, dangerous game. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that's the appropriate advice, but but we do take... Uh, you know, painstaking efforts to be conservative to assure that, you know, we will do everything we can to to meet our projections and beat our projections. And certainly there's economic conditions such as we're now with the COVID that can make that more challenging. But in terms of normal economic conditions and the way we underwrite and look at those deals, we generally will beat those projections that we, we put out. So you brought up COVID. What what do you see being different in the multifamily real estate game post-COVID or during COVID? How has that changed the multifamily space? Yeah, I think as as everyone knows, this has been um, you know kind of an unprecedented time, and and no one ever anticipated anything 
anything remotely close to this. So, you know, as we buy properties, as we underwrite, as we look at them, we, we always know that we're going to be seeing a downturn. Uh, but I don't think anyone, including ourselves, ever imagined so quick and so hard. Uh, when we first, the COVID hit and, and the you know, reaction was basically to close down the economy, we were, of course, very concerned. Um, many of the jurisdictions put in eviction moratorium, moratoriums, meaning that we cannot evict any of our residents, whether they pay or not. And that, of course, was a, a big concern, knowing that there was going to be substantial unemployment. It would be hard for the residents to pay. And we anticipated significant collection loss. And we have been extremely pleasantly surprised that that has really not come to fruition. We have seen some higher collection or bad debt loss than we normally do, but it really has not been that substantial. Now, the federal government has put out a lot of subsidies, which have certainly helped. But whereas we typically will have a one to one and a half percent bad debt loss, what we've seen in the last three to four months is probably more in the three to four percent range, which of course is, is higher than we're used to, but but nowhere where it becomes majorly troublesome. And what we do is when we underwrite a deal, we do what we call sensitivity analysis, where we look at the property and say, how much can revenue go down? before we are actually negative on the cash flow. And in most cases, that tends to be between 20 and 25%. So a bump of you know 2 to 3% on the collections is relatively small. And again, we do not know how long this will last. So we're being very cautious in terms of, of the improvements we're doing, in terms of the distributions we're making to our partners because we don't know how long it'll last. We don't know if these federal subsidies will continue. But overall, on an operations perspective, it has been um, surprisingly strong. I think the fact that we have a very good, strong in-house property management team that jumped on this very quickly has made a big difference. There was a period, uh, certainly for two, three months, where we really could not in-person tour potential residents, new residents in our property. So we quickly set up virtual tours online and ways for the the potential tenants to tour on their own. And that has been very effective. So the occupancy has held up very strong. We're actually, the current portfolio is about 96% occupancy, which is very healthy. We typically will target 95%. So again, on the operations side, it's been very very good, very strong. I think across the board on real estate, multifamily generally has held up well. I think we've done better than most of our competitors. Industrial has held up well. Retail and uh, hotels and office really have been hit hard. And I think we'll be struggling and seeing more value loss than we, we have and will in multifamily. <clears throat> and then on the other end of the spectrum in terms of COVID would be values of the properties. And similarly, when it first started the pan you know the pandemic we felt like values would go go down significantly we were looking forward to what we thought was going to be some significant distress and opportunities but that has not panned out as well and we've actually seen values that have held up quite quite well so there's been quite a bit less activity in terms of acquisitions and just transactions in general part of that is people just couldn't get out and tour most owners of properties were just holding tight saying, you know, let me see what happens here. Because operations have held up well, there has not really been the distress. So right now we're really start to see more properties hit the market. And most of the sales we have seen, even though there have not been a whole lot, have been pretty close to the pre-COVID prices. And a big factor there is that interest rates are extremely low, unprecedented historical low interest rates for apartments. And I think that has held up the values significantly. And one of the reasons I think across the board in real estate, we're not necessarily seeing as good a debt or as low a debt as we are in multifamily, but Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, both quasi-government agencies who tend to be the main lenders. And in our case, um, we do probably 95% of the loans we do are with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And because they are government subsidized, they've been putting out amazingly good loans now. And we're about to 
you know, close on a deal next month where we're going to have a 10-year fixed loan at about 2.7%. We recently did a refinance on a variable rate loan where the all-in rate was 1.76%. So this is really pushing the or holding the values and keep, keeping them up as those rates will definitely provide strong cash on cash returns and strong cash flow to the properties. That's fantastic. Um, so currently, though, we're seeing the unemployment rate still be 11, 12 percent in the country. So at some point when these government subsidies wear off and the, we're not allowed to push off auto payments and rent payment and, you know, all the all the subsidies that are out there, that's got to come home to roost at some point where people are unable to pay the rent. How do you think that plays out? for the multifamily market? Yeah, I think the the federal subsidies have clearly enabled the residents, even those that lost their jobs, to, to continue to pay. So if the government does cut back, I think we will be seeing higher bad debts. I don't think it'll be catastrophic. As I mentioned earlier, we're in the kind of 3 to 4% bad debt right now. Uh, maybe that trickles up a few percent more. But again, I think it will not be catastrophic. And we have been pleasantly surprised at the residents, not only ability to pay, but motivation, because, you know, the concern is if you cannot evict someone, even if they have the ability to pay, are they going to take advantage, be an opportunist and not pay? And we really have not seen that or very, very little of that. So, you know, how long this lasts will have a big bearing on it you know, when we get the vaccine. Uh, but certainly until there is some stability of a vaccine, unemployment starting to go down, we'll probably continue to see the, the bad debts go up modestly. And as the and I think the general school of thought, and I would tend to agree, is to get back fully to a pre-COVID kind of operations is probably a good year to two out. And again, a lot of uncertainty and, and factors that will play into that. But it seems like it'll be a year or two before we hit kind of that pre-COVID numbers without a dramatic drop during that interim period. Okay. What trends do you see or how do you guys underwrite property today post-COVID or during COVID that you didn't, what considerations have you added to your underwriting process in underwriting a new deal that you didn't have prior to COVID? Yeah, I think it's primarily on the revenue side where we are increasing the bad debts. We are acknowledging that there will probably not only not be rental increases in the next year or two, but either a flat or slightly down period. I think occupancies will hold, but we're seeing revenue in the next, say, 12 to 18 months. That's probably roughly 10% below where we may have seen it pre-COVID. So I think it's primarily on the revenue side. The other thing we're seeing is our general model is a value-add strategy where we go into the property and do renovations be it exterior where we could be improving the amenities, the clubhouses, the pools, maybe gating a community, painting it, improving the landscaping, as well as interiors when units turn over, you know, putting in new countertops and maybe new cabinet fronts and better floorings. And at this point with the sensitivity of the residents of, of getting the best price and, and such, that we're holding off on those interior renovations and generally some of the exterior as well. So that's both ones that we already had planned that we've put on hold, but also as we underwrite new potential acquisitions, we're saying, okay, maybe it does make sense to do these renovations, but we're not going to start them until we've held the property for two years already versus uh, historically we would typically dive in and, and want to get those renovations done as soon as possible. Okay. Are there particular markets that you see as more attractive now uh, during COVID or post-COVID? Um, certainly the, the COVID impact uh, will hit some markets more than others. For instance, we have a fairly significant presence in Las Vegas, 
and with their heavy dependence on gaming and tourist industry, they're hit harder. But that doesn't necessarily mean we wouldn't buy there now. I think it's all a function of price and how that's priced into the market. So we are looking you know, at each market and the employment profile and how that will impact the returns going forward. But at this point, as I mentioned earlier, we're in, we're in Washington, Oregon, California, Arizona, and Nevada. And I think we're looking in all of the markets that we're in and tracking what the impact will be based upon the unemployment and each economy of how it will be affected. And then looking at the pricing in that market. So again, even if a, if a market might be hard hit, that may, may well be the opportunity for us to buy today versus maybe a stronger, more stable market. But what we are seeing market to market in terms of operations, Phoenix has held up extremely well, um, almost no impact in COVID. I think our bad debt loss there has been below 1%. We're seeing LA being hit fairly hard and parts of Northern California. And I think the main reason for that tends to be the political climate where the governments have been a bit more aggressive with telling the residents what their rights are and maybe more people taking advantage. So we've seen LA being I mean, probably the hardest hit of our markets. Surprisingly, Las Vegas has actually held up pretty well. And I'm sure that is a function of the unemployment subsidies, but it's, it's, it's held up pretty strong. And then, you know, Portland and Seattle have held up well. LA and Northern California have been hit hard. San Diego has, has really not been hit hard. So again, it's market by market and, you know, different reasons, be it the job picture or sometimes the political picture that are impacting, you know, both the operations. And at this point, you know, a little bit early for us to determine some of the values, but the values may, you know, may or may not be the right time to buy, depending, you know, whether or not it is hard hit on the operations, just on how the, the buyers are perceiving the values. Sure. What kind of transaction volume are you expecting over the next 12 months or so? Or even maybe a better question, when do you expect transaction volume to get back to 2019 levels for MG properties? You know, we I think when the crisis started, the pandemic, we felt like the rest of this year would be slow. That, first of all, even though we early on thought there'd be more distress than there would be, we felt like it would be probably a good, you know, six to 12 months before owners actually experienced that distress and were motivated to sell the property. We're not really seeing that play out because we're just not seeing the distress that we thought there was going to be. But what we are seeing is with the incredibly low interest rates and with values holding up more and more properties that are now being marketed where, you know, we had a three month period where it was very, very few. So I think we are going to see acquisition activity pick up relatively quickly. We actually are right now under contract on a deal in Portland, which will be mostly funded from exchange money that we have. Uh, but the, the profile of that seems to be where the best opportunity is immediately, and that's new construction. It's not typically what we've done historically because it doesn't have that value add model. But what we are seeing is that the developers tend to have, I wouldn't say distress, but maybe heavier motivation than others because we're seeing many new potential developments that are now being put on hold. The lease ups, those properties that are just completing but are in lease up to, to get full are, are much slower and having to offer much more significant concessions. Most of the developers and particularly the, the merchant builders, those that build in order to sell quickly, tend to be a little bit more cash strapped than, than some of the long-term owners. So that seems to be the opportunity today is these new construction deals. And there's a couple others that we're looking at in California right now that may or may not come to fruition. But, but right now, I think that tends to be the best opportunities. Uh, the other thing I think we're seeing now is people recognizing that 
the values have held up and whereas there's a hesitation to go to market and sell over the last few months they're saying you know i can now get a price pre-covid i can you know book that gain and maybe take some of the risk off the table because as a owner seller i don't know you know what's going to happen in the next 12 or 18 months and in fact we saw ourselves a couple of sales in phoenix which i mentioned earlier has held up very well that were extremely high prices. We were very surprised to see that. So we actually put one of our properties on the market in Phoenix, and we're right now going through the process. But we feel the price we're getting, and we, we have gone through the first round of offers, are actually higher than we had valued the property at pre-COVID. So again, Phoenix has been a very strong market, held up stronger. But in that case, we feel like with where the pricing is today, interest rates are today, we are better as a seller going to market today than waiting and taking the risk over the next, say, 12 to 18 months of potential downside on the operations. So again, with that, we I believe activity will pick up almost immediately is picking up. I think in terms of getting back to 2019 levels, I, I think in... Not immediately, I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think in 2021 and maybe mid-year we'll be at the point where we'll see volume that is similar to 2019. But I do think even today going forward, we're gonna see quite a bit more transactions than we've seen the last few months. Well, that's good to hear. This year is an election year, and with that comes legislative risks. And I was, uh, looking through the Democratic platform to see that there are some things that, that we enjoy in MG Properties transactions that perhaps 1031 exchange rights might be impacted or potentially they could re-examine an accelerated depreciation. How do you think all that potentially plays? Do you see legislative risk potentially ahead for MG Properties and MG Property transaction? Yes, I think there certainly is some risk. I think the 1031 exchanges, which obviously is a, is a key to our strategy and, and what we do, and I know as mentioned recently in the, the Democratic platform as being something they're looking at, either eliminating or reducing. But the 1031s have been around now for about 100 years. And you know, in my career, the last 30 years, there's been a number of times where we've heard threats or discussion as to eliminating them and it never seems to happen i think when those discussions become a little bit more serious it's recognized that there's a tremendous benefit to the economy of having 1031 exchanges it encourages more transaction activity it encourages buyers to purchase properties and renovate them and fix them up um, obviously the real estate industry has some strong lobbyists that will be fighting for it so it's certainly not out of the question that it could be either eliminated or reduced, but I don't think that it's likely to happen just based on what we've heard and seen over you know many, many years and the fact that it is kind of a cornerstone of the real estate industry. I think what it would do for us if that happens, uh, it would certainly change our strategy somewhat. There is the opportunity to refinance properties if you don't want to recognize any taxable gain. And I, I prefer the exchange model. It gives us the opportunity to go into a new property, renovate and fix it up. But if we shift it to more of a refinance model, I think it would still be beneficial and work well for our limited partners. And then in terms of the depreciation, right now the depreciation is just so high that I think even if it were reduced, it still would be very favorable. I think in the 2017 Tax Act where they had the basically Accelerated depreciation where day one when you buy a property, all the personal property can be expensed, has created such substantial losses that most of the significant investors in real estate that have bought properties the last few years have major passive losses because of that depreciation. And even if that were reduced, I think that would be still more than adequate in order to provide shelter against the cash flow on the property. So I'm not too concerned about depreciation um, adjustments. The tax-free exchange, again, um, would be more concerning in terms of a negative to the real estate industry, but there are certainly changes in strategies that still could be effective 
even if that does go away, which again, I believe is unlikely. Fantastic. Well, great to hear you, uh, how you would pivot and shift based on new legislative uh, hurdles. What do you see as the road ahead here in, in closing thoughts about the, the industry and MG properties and any, any final thoughts there? Yeah, we've, you know, we've always been an extremely disciplined, specialized company. All we invest in is multifamily properties and within, you know, just the five Western states where we know those markets extremely well. We've got deep relationships with the brokers and principals in those markets. And even within the apartment space, we tend to specialize in the workforce housing, the more lifetime renter, which tends to be more stable. And I think that has proven to be a very good, safe strategy. People always need a roof over their head and a place to live. And it certainly has played out during this current crisis where we've seen the multifamily hold up very well and many of the other property types like hotels and retail and office have been hit hard and that's what we really have seen and experienced throughout you know this last century so you know we're certainly very comfortable and happy that we're in that multifamily space and we plan on sticking with the same strategy that we've done now for the last 30 years, and that is to be in a limited number of markets that we know extremely well, having a vertically integrated group that has a strong management team, and just following the same you know, model that we have, we have done and continuing to grow, get more economies of scale. In terms of, of our growth, it's really been adding geographies, not necessarily doing anything different than we've done. Right now, uh, we are looking very hard and, and have for the last few years at Denver and plan on entering that market. And our plan would be to continue what we've been successful for over the last 30 years of you know, growing our portfolio and providing the cash flow and, and long-term returns to our partners. Well, I know speaking for our clients have been extremely satisfied. Uh, Mark's group is a pleasure to work with and they do a plus work. Mark, thank you so very much for coming on the show today. Eric, thanks for having us on today. It's been a pleasure. And Mark, thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Derek. Mark and Derek, this is fantastic. I I'm, I'm just sitting here, Mark, listening to you, listening to the numbers that you're putting out. And I mean, it's all positive. I mean, I, I know that there are things possibly coming and we, we never know what's ahead in the future but just the fact that you're able to report such positive things during this time it was very encouraging to me thank you so much for joining us today thank you thank you very much you bet derek again you always bring on the best guests <laughs> i'm just gonna say it uh, I, I appreciate you doing that and you did a beautiful beautiful interview and i appreciate you having mark on the show thank you both you guys have a fantastic weekend and i'll talk to you both soon all right, that sounds good. And the last thank you always goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast with the team from Secure Wealth Advisory. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when they come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Secure Wealth Advisory, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Centura Wealth Advisory. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Centura Wealth Advisory, Centura, is an SEC registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in San Diego, California. 
Centura and its representatives are in compliance with the current registration and notice filing requirements imposed on SEC-registered investment advisors, in which Centura maintains clients. Centura may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Tax relief varies based on client circumstances and all clients do not achieve the same results.